So hello there and welcome to another tutorial. My name is Tammy Bakshi and today I'm joined by Rob High, the CTO and VP of IBM Watson and my mentor. Thank you very much for, for being a part today, Rob. It's great to have you here again, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. So today we're going to be talking about the Watson Studio and more specifically how it relates to the call for code and how you can build analytics, AI-powered solutions that enable you to impact the field of disaster preparedness so you can help out those who are being affected by natural disasters using the power of, of the Watson Studio. So the Watson Studio, Rob, would you like to just give us a quick brief on really what that is and what it allows us to do? Yeah, it's, Watson Studio is really a tool set that is targeted at people who want to build analytic um, or AI-based solutions. Uh, it includes a number of sub-tools, including Jupyter Notebooks, yes. including our uh, the deep learning, uh, visual construction tooling, mm -hmm. um, access to our knowledge uh, catalogs, yes. uh, the ability to both uh, gain access to and publish, as well as um, to curate some of the data that you bring exactly. on board. Um, so it's really a suite of tools, and it's really called, it's really targeted at what we might normally refer to as data scientists, but mm -hmm. really it's a much broader class of people. It doesn't require that you have a yes. PhD in yeah, analytics exactly. or algorithms to be able to do uh, anything useful with, and it really allows you to get in and begin to detail out and decompose your problem. Mm -hmm. Use Jupyter Notebooks to kind of organize your thinking around the thing you're trying to analyze, to import data, um, normalize that data, curate it, yes. and then lay out the algorithmic approach that you want to take for assessing what the data is trying to tell you, yes. uh, including driving all the way down into using various languages for mm -hmm. building these algorithms with. That is great. Now, one thing that you said there really sort of fascinates me, and that is that you don't need to be a machine learning expert to use Watson Studio. You don't need to you know, have a PhD in data science or machine learning, whatever else it may be, in order to use this tool in order to build your own applications. And so let's just say, you know, I wanted to build an application that used the Watson Studio. I could use tools, as you mentioned, uh, like data refinery that's built in to help me pre-process, figure out what my data is like, visualize it, get a better idea of what it is. I could use the open source Jupyter Notebooks, mm -hmm. and so I'm not even just limited to using, say, the wonderful Watson services. Mm -hmm. I could use other open source technologies. Maybe I want to build my own custom model using Keras. Yeah. Uh, I can do whatever I want to inside the Jupyter Notebooks. And in fact, if you're using a supported library like Keras, you can actually mm -hmm. build the neural networks in a graphical user interface with the sure. neural network modeler. Uh, but let's just say that I were taking a look at a more specific use case. And also, one more thing, though, would be, like, for example, the community tab. Mm -hmm. There are also mm -hmm. tons of different projects projects and, and neural network designs and data sets that people publish onto the community yeah. of Watson Studio. In fact, you can as well, uh, and you can collaborate with people inside of that experience. But getting back to the point, let's just say that I wanted to build an application that predicts how intense a wildfire is going to be mm -hmm. based off of where it's located, of course, and a few more environmental factors. In fact, this is actually an open source data set from NASA. Right. And there's actually a code pattern on this, and there'll be a link to it down in the description below. Uh, but let's Let's just say that I was working towards this use case and I wanted to use the Watson Studio to build a custom machine learning model suited just for my needs. Could you kind of walk us through how you would do that mm -hmm. um, and what kinds of tools you'd use and what you'd use them for? Yeah, well, let's start with the data. Um, and as you pointed out, some of that data is available now, but you know you still need to make sure that it's shaped and yes. it's got the right characteristics in it that you're looking for. There may be some aspects of the data that you care about, some that you don't care about. There may be other data that you want to bring in. Um, and so first step is, is to walk through and, and what I think of as being a curation process. A lot of that is about just simply making sure the data is mm -hmm. in the shape that you want it to be in. So that'd be step one. Now, once you've got the data ingested, step two is to begin to understand what your objective is. What is it that you're trying to get from this data? In the case of disaster preparedness, maybe what you're trying to do is identify where the the fire is likely to progress yes. given the data that you've got available to you. Or it could be, you know, where you want equipment. You know, mm -hmm. how are you going to manage and prepare for um, this disaster as it unfolds? If you got uh, any advanced warning that exactly. may be coming up to the the potential maybe it's a maybe it's a uh, a hurricane or a yeah. storm that you know is coming in or or unfortunately in, in some cases it may be something that's already happened. Mm -hmm. But in either case, you know, managers and people who are involved with managing a disaster situation, mm -hmm. you know, need to be able to think about where they're going to place this equipment and yes. and uh, where it's going to be best used, what the needs are and so forth. So if that's part of what you're trying to do, then of course having that objective in mind, you can begin to work backwards and decompose how would you go about predicting for the things you need to predict? You mm -hmm. know, 
we talked about one, you know, where what you want to be able to do is identify um, what people need. You know, exactly. they, they're already in the midst of the disaster. They've already been affected by um, whatever the consequences were. Maybe that they're stuck in their home and they are out of food or water. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you know, how would you use something like visual recognition to go in and identify somebody who's, you know, calling or asking for that particular need? Maybe mm -hmm. they got a sign or something like yeah. that. Um, so, you know, working backwards to what you're trying to, to solve mm -hmm. for and then using Jupyter Notebook to begin to organize that. Yeah. Right. As you do that organization, you're going to identify the need for specific analytics. And so you're going to have to go in and drill into that. You're going to have to go build the algorithms. You're going to have to do the machine learning. You're going to have to go construct the, the approach that you want to take for identifying the thing that you're looking for, the thing you're trying to predict. Mm -hmm. And again, in Jupyter Notebook, if you switch out of that and into some of the machine learning uh, technologies. You may come into it knowing that you've got a set of libraries that you've already been playing with. Maybe you're familiar with one yes. of the open source projects around TensorFlow or around you know, Cafe or, as you say, Keras or one of those others. Uh, PyTorch is getting increasingly popular. Yes, yes. Um, so, you know, you can import um, those libraries and, and kernels and make use of them within, within the Jupyter Notebook. If you're building a complex model, like a deep learning model, um, you may want to go in and use one of our visual tools for a uh, tool for deep learning construction. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's really nice because you can use it to parameterize the different layers of yes. the deep learning model. You can resequence the, the pooling mm -hmm. and various techniques that you might apply in the construction of your model. Yes. And then, of course, you know, you're going to then use that in the context of that data to see what kinds of results you're able to produce. Absolutely. Eventually, you may decide that what you've got is a really well formed set of analytic. And you want to take the algorithms that you've constructed and now export them for production use. In mm. which case, you now turn this into um, running code and into a services with an API that you exactly. want to publish somewhere on the cloud, perhaps, and uh, make use of that within your application. Mm -hmm. That is great. Thank you very much, Rob, for giving me that uh, overview as to how you go about using the Watson Studio. So as you can tell, the Watson Studio is really a tool for you to go in and build your own analytic or machine learning applications without you having to be an expert in this field. And at the same time, you can make use of practically any library you want to. You can use all the open source tools that you know and love. And if you're an expert, you can go really deep inside of your data. You can reshape it. You can take a look at what's important. You can find patterns, even yourself, that you you wouldn't have noticed without the Watson Studio and all of the tools that it provides. But thank you very much all for giving us that detailed overview. Now though, in part two, you're going to be seeing a live demo of how you can actually use the Watson Studio in order to take a custom data set and actually understand it inside and out using a, a bunch of the different tools that the Watson Studio provides. So again, thank you very much, Rob, for joining in today. And that's Henry, what we had. Thank you, guys. Of course. Thank you very much, Rob. Glad to have you on uh, on the channel here at Astor Place. And of course, thank you very much, everyone, for joining in today. Uh, that's what I had for this tutorial today. Really do hope you enjoyed. Apart from that, if you do have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, you can email uh, or contact either I or Rob. So, Rob, how can, how can the viewers contact you? I'm on LinkedIn under uh, Rob, Robert High and uh, on Twitter at uh, R High, R H I G H. That's perfect. I'll put your contact down in the description below so that you can go ahead and contact Rob if you'd like to. Uh, and you can, of course, contact me. My email and Twitter will be in the description as well. But if you have any more questions, please do leave them in the comments down below. And Rob and I would love to get back to you. Again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining in today. Uh, that's going to be all for this tutorial. If you do enjoy the content on the channel, please do make sure to subscribe. And if you'd like to be notified when Ever release new videos, please do click the bell icon and you'll receive an email every time I upload a new video. Again, thank you very much, Rob, for joining in. Bye bye. Bye now.